Let, let me explain a bit what's happening there. We are we are in Venice with the uh, with the Palazzo uh, Palazzo Michel with some students having a workshop during all week that we call uh, new materials, new ornaments. And each evening we have a, a, a conference, and you you're starting the week. Okay. What, what a privilege. Yeah. Okay. So we have students from uh, uh, several countries. We are a little group of students. Uh, we, have, uh, we are 15. And we have people uh, connected uh, by internet, by Zoom, outside the workshop. Okay. 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 Yeah. And, Very uh, good. So, I will present you a little bit. It's been in English because we have some uh, non French people. Few of them. So, Uncle Picon is an architect, engineer from the prestigious French Polytechnic School. He's professor of history of architecture and technology at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and director of recherche at the Col des Ponts and chairman of the Fondation de Cantit, if you are only architect there. Um, among all the publications that uh, we published, uh, two of them interest us. Uh, one book called Ornament, the Politics of Architecture and Subjectivity, and another book published, very recently published, The Materiality of Architecture. So, Okay, uh, Beatrice, can you mute your mic? Because it's actually, it will be probably better. Um, for the other, why don't you put your camera for, the, for some of you so that I have the impression that I'm speaking to living beings. Uh, and let's start. Uh, thank you. Hello, Andrea. Hello, uh, Kelly. So let me start by sharing my screen the usual thing, and let's hope the god of Zoom is with me. And there comes the ritual question. Can you see the slide? Okay. So, to try to fit with Beatrice's agenda, I've, co I've called this lecture Architectural Ornament, Materiality, and the Chal Challenges of the Anthropocene. So to juxtapose the terms, so my plan is basically to speak for between 45 and 50 minutes, hopefully, and you know, probably we can have half an hour of Q&A if that's okay with you. I'll try, I try not to be too long though. I, this is a new lecture, so it might be longer than what I, ex, I may expect because I have never given it. So to juxtapose the terms ornament and Anthropocene uh, may seem like a provocation at first, because indeed we have inherited from modernist architect the idea that ornament is not a very serious thing. You know, law said that it was a crime, but actually for many modern architect, it was not even a crime. It was basically something superficial, arbitrary, et cetera, et cetera. So something not very serious, whereas the Anthropocene carries with it the extremely serious notion of an impending crisis that threatened the very existence of mankind. One thing to note is that beyond the modernist legacy, ornament was always a very problematic notion. It was inseparable from a series of paradoxes. The first is linked to the fact that if you did not have enough ornament, one was not really speaking about architecture. But too much ornament was equally damaging because it began to dissolve the architectural composition, something that Piranesi at the end of the 18th century played upon in composition like this one. Ornament was a little bit like Plato's pharmacon, something curative in small doses and a poison beyond a certain quantity. But beyond that, ornament subverted also established hierarchies between the accessory and the essential. On the one hand, ornament was supposed to be added to the fabric of the building thus appearing as a kind of supplement. On the other hand, as architects repeatedly stated, 
ornament was perhaps the most essential part of architecture. And Schinkel, the great German architect, gave a very literal translate, uh, version of that at his Bau Academy in Berlin, where he added very literally uh, terracotta, uh, terracotta frieze while stating that without ornament, there would be no architecture. So ornament encapsulated probably one of the most profound truths about architecture, namely that it was both an addition to construction and something that completely transfigured it from within. In one of his poem, Paul Valéry, Paul Valéry, the French poet famously said that the deepest thing in man is the skin. We live at a moment when we tend once again to split the world in two by distinguishing between the serious, the fundamental on the one hand and the accessory and futile on the other. So an ornament clearly doesn't fit into this kind of split. So in architecture, it tends to translate by an opposition between serious design endeavors having to do with the need to limit carbon emission and to mitigate climate change and allegedly more superficial attempts privileging aesthetics. There is of course a strong moral undertone to this kind of idea be, uh, and split between the serious and the superficial. Less aesthetic, more ethics. The title of the 2000 Venice Biennale could serve as a motto today, even if at the time the Biennale was very much still about aesthetics. So from such a perspective, can ornament be ethical in the age of the Anthropocene is a question that is worth raising. So as you may imagine, I'm going to argue that from a certain perspective, yes, ornament has to do with very fundamental question, among others, a question of ethics. But let me note prior to developing this argument that today's ornament is seldom associated with the question of the Anthropocene. Its so-called return is usually connected to the rise of the digital, to the interest in patterns, textures, and to the capacity of digital tools to manipulate them in creative ways. And digital fabrication, for example, has a very clear connection with ornament. So this is a trail that I've followed myself in my book on ornament that Beatrice was kind enough to mention. But in the same book, by articulating ornament with question of subjectivity and politics, I was actually already trying to go beyond the standard narrative associating completely ornament and the digital. Okay, so far, still surviving. Good, let's move on. Ornament and the materiality just, of art. Just what, uh, Antoine? Uh, yes. The sound is not that great. Maybe you can a bit. I uh, can probably try to maybe raise it. Be closer of your microphone and maybe talk yeah. a bit slower. Uh, slow is difficult for me. Okay. Can you hear me better now or not? Can you know? Yeah, it's a bit better. Maybe on your side, because I have a good microphone, actually. I have a professional microphone. So usually, uh, so I don't know. You may want to raise the sound of your computer, actually, a little bit. Really? Yeah. Hmm? OK. Yeah, but. You have the sound of your computer? I'm going to mute it, but. Because my microphone is a good microphone, so normally it works. Okay. Hmm? No, 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 in terms of its relevance, ornament deploys itself in two directions that seem at first extremely different, not to say incompatible. The first is that ornament has to do with matter. One of its function is to sublimate matter to emphasize its sometimes hidden quality. One could say that ornament is matter staged by architecture. And just to take an example, you know, this is a Sullivan detail. 
and you know the materiality of the cast iron, etc., is very much revealed by ornament. So let's note that matter is something that is both self-evident and always a bit elusive, because you know matter fall under the senses literally, but you know what is it exactly remains the ultimate mystery. So matter is associated with something profoundly non-human a priori, is the other of the human. But then ornament has also to do with subjectivity. And in my book, I tried to show that ornament had to do with a series of subject, beginning by the designers, that even the profiles of moldings say something about the personality of the designer of the ornament. So ornament was actually one of the way to be an author in the architectural field. But ornament was also associated to other subjects. For example, there were people, not necessarily designers, but which produced by carving the ornament, by carving, sculpting it, etc. Like here, the ornament may have been designed, this is the Garnier Opera in Paris by Charles Garnier, but actually there is a sculptor who produces the ornament. And in the 19th century, this idea of the hand of the craftsman was to become more and more important. And this is what Ruskin would chiefly retain about ornament. But there were also other subjects, like for example, clients. And then for example, internal or ornament were about the social rank, social status, but also about personality. It may not seem evident to a country observer, but for an 18th century uh, uh, person, it is evidently a female interior. And the, the, the association with uh, the female gender is uh, conveyed by the ornament. So all that to say that ornament was both about matter and about the human subject, which is kind of strange if you think a little bit about it, because matter is supposed to be, you know, what resists to the human, what is exterior to the human. So, uh, what uh, what the ornament suggested actually is that there could be a relation between matter and humanity, and uh, or and that architecture through ornament could provide a mediation between the two. So this is for me related to this notion you mentioned. Actually, the, yes, what I so this is so in as if. You know, or one of the tasks of ornament was literally to animate matter so that it could enter in a relationship with the humans. So this is, in my opinion, related to the notion of materiality that I've tried to approach in my latest book, uh, precisely the materiality of architecture, with the idea that materiality is not matter, it's actually the relation that humans have to matter in a given society at a given moment in history. So materiality is not something entirely given once and for all, but something that evolves, uh, that is related to the way we relate to tangible objects and phenomena. And of course, this varies, for example, we, for example, today we live in a completely different world than, you know, 17th century people, et cetera, and our relation to the physical world is different. So one of the ideas I've developed in the book, but, not all, but also in a series of articles, et cetera, is that actually through our relation with the physical world, we tend to define ourselves as humans. And materiality is something that has to do with the relation we have with what is tangible, what we consider as tangible. And today, for example, you know, there are a lot of things, you know, waves, for example, that we don't necessarily see. We nevertheless consider them as part of the tangible world. So the way we relate to this world, which is out there in its physical form, etc., cetera, say something about who we are, okay? I'm not going too fast. So I one for me, an interesting text conveying this idea. There, there are a lot of architects, by the way, who say things like that, you know, Tada Orlando, but many others, Louis Kahn, et cetera. But for me, one of the best texts is actually a French philosopher of the 18th century who imagines 
uh, writes a treatise on sensations. And he imagines, it's a philosophical fiction, that at the beginning you have a statue that is endowed with the possibility to know and to possibly become self-conscious. But she has, at, at first, she's completely blind. She has no hearing, no sound, no smell, no touch, no whatsoever. And Condillac imagines the succession of discovery that she makes when she acquires vision, she acquires hearing, smell, touch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the most interesting passage for me in the book is actually when he writes actually not about vision, which is not that key in his argument, but touch. And Condillac says that the statue acquires touch and she begins to move around and she finds obstacle. And because she finds obstacle, she begins to realize that, you know, she's not the totality of the world, that she has to live in a world and to negotiate with it. And this is for Condillac, the beginning of the discovery of self-consciousness. So my argument is to say that in some ways, uh, you know, uh, materiality is about the way we understand the world, but also is about the way we understand ourselves. To take a less, a more everyday example, think of the way little children become aware gradually of themselves as well as of the world that surround them by touching, playing with objects, et cetera, et cetera. So a little bit this kind of idea. So where do I want to go? With the idea that actually the most fundamental thing that architecture does is actually has to do with materiality. That is to suggest some type of relation between all selves and built masses and, and to suggest that actually these built masses have a relation with the way we are. Okay, so far, it's, it's going to get worse. So be prepared. So for me, this is linked to another thing, which is the notion of inhabiting. You may all have heard that architecture is about inhabiting, et cetera. What does it mean to inhabit? It means actually to be in contact with a number of tangible elements. They may be furniture, but very often walls, windows, or it may be a public space, which is defined spatially. This is a modernist house in Hawaii, which, but uh, it could be anything. And to inhabit is to be able to, in some way, uh, understand a little bit better who you are because you enter in relation with light, with built masses, et cetera, et cetera. For those who are French, uh, real estate brokers now speak a lot about uh, projecting, projecting oneself in a house, je me projette, which means that basically you can imagine yourself in an apartment or a house. And when you do that, actually, you, it means that you enter in a relation, etc. So materiality for me suggests that we have a place in this world, that matter is not this unfriendly out there reality, that there is a place for the human out there, a place that the human can call theirs. So, and it suggests also that once we inhabit or action acquire a relevance, they acquire the beginning of a meaning. It's no longer the, um, you know, the random movement of an animal, it becomes something that acquires a human relevance. So for me, this is what ornament, by the way, ornament was one of the key ways in which architecture organized inhabiting. So, and in some ways ornament, because it touched both to matter and to subjectivity was in this key place. And in some ways to make the world inhabitable was synonymous with ornamenting it. Uh, and the world thus could become a stage for human action. This is, of course, the, um, uh, the Renaissance theater of Vicenza. But uh, this idea, which is, I think, the, the most important, is this idea of that architecture frames, in some ways, uh, human action. So I've taken here a quotation that I quite like. 
by a specialist of ornament, actually, Oleg Grabar, who said, by understanding ornamental architecture, etc., we are perhaps simply acknowledging the more profound truth of architecture, that it is always at the service of man and has no greater purpose than to adorn its manifold activities, etc. So architecture, in some ways, what architecture does, it literally frames human uh, life and human action. Okay, so far? So where do I want to go from there? To the idea that, you know, I say that materiality has evolved throughout time. Uh, and in the book on materiality, but even before, uh, I have interpreted the rise of the digital in relation to the rise of a new form of materiality. And at this stage, what I'd like to argue is that despite the tendency to think of the digital independently from concerns for the environmental crisis and the quest for a sustainable world, both shouldn't be arbitrarily separated. Actually, I began to work some 15 years ago on the digital, but now I'm more and more interested not in the digital proper, but in the necessity of the convergence between the digital and environmental concern because I think they're both part of the same transition of a, more, a global cultural transition that can be approached through this notion of a new materiality on the rise. Does not mean that this is without tension. The digital, the cloud in particular, as we all know, is the fastest growing source of energy consumption. It's not yet. The, 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 the largest energy consumption sector, but it's the fastest rising. And it raises a lot of question. And e-waste, for example, is reaching dramatic dimension today. But these contradictions, for me, are part of the game. Materiality is never a monolithic thing. It is something that is contested, divided. It's actually a field, a contested field. And let me precise also that what I call materiality is not reducible to something like a thought, an idea, a representation, what we think of matter and of ourself and of their relation at a given moment. It, of course, they are I thought in it, but it, it's rather the deep structure, the regime that organizes part of our relation to the physical world. Okay. So let me try to evoke a few features of this new materiality. So let me begin by something very concrete. Uh, first, is that we know you may wonder who is this strange guy. It's actually a material scientist. We are actually, we've been living an, a kind of silent revolution for the past 30 years, which is a revolution in materials. We understand much better how materials function to the point that we can play with them in ways which were impossible before. Uh, we are able to, for example, this is uh, you know, a detail of a so-called green concrete thing, but you know, we can really understand material and design material at a power, with a power of resolution that was certainly not possible some 30 to 40 years ago. And the digital, of course, is present in this evolution. Uh, it, materials we have discovered are not static. They live, they circulate, they participate to an endless circulation. They are part of a kind of global met metabolism. And this is, for example, the cycle of concrete. Uh, and we realize that actually what we call matter and materials are infinite, are very often flows, which may actually circulate. Uh, more or less rapidly. So now to turn to the human. You all, the uh, whole swath of contrary thought and philosophy insist on the fact that we cannot, we are not absolutely separated from matter. And the, the critique of Descartes uh, dualism is a kind of commonplace. And with the idea that actually we are deeply related to matter. You know, the, the, the new, we were always connected to matter. This is what materiality is a bit about, but the new materiality that is unfolding these days is about becoming more than before conscious of all that 
relates us to matter and through matter to the more general category of the non-human. We've never spoken so much, uh, we've never used as much this expression, the non-human, but, uh, but uh, it's actually to signal that human and non-human are kind of inseparable. And with, so sorry, that's the short philosophical moment, but for those who've read Bruno Latour, it means that humanity is not a distinct essence. It lies in the mediation between the non-human and the human. The we've never been modern is really, by Latour is really about that. So it goes, by the way, with a dream of pacification. What if actually the future was about rediscovering a kind of complicity, a kind of connivence of partnership with matter instead of imposing violently forms upon it. And this has given, this is a theme you can find in British anthropologist Tim Ingold, but this is also something you find in Richard Sennett, who tries to rehabilitate the craftsman. And it is also something that explains the new interest taken in Ruskin. You know, a lot of people are rereading Ruskin these days because of this idea of the craftsman, the kind of uh, kind of complete uh, solidarity between human, non-human, between human and matter. So with that goes the challenge of a certain a number of modernist dichotomies. For example, there is no clear outside and inside ourselves. If we are in continuity with the world, what if actually the skin was not our true limit? So is there an inside and an in outside? But in architecture, a critique of the, the, the traditional position between the structural as opposed to the non-structural. And we go back to the idea that the skin may be deeper than the skeleton at the siege of complex exchanges. And in architecture, it leads to ideas such as the crisis of tectonics and with the idea that actually thermal exchanges may be more important today than load descent. Also among the dichotomies that tend to be challenged, the tr traditionally there was an opposition between the material and the abstract, the material and the computational. And today you have a whole number of people who say, no, actually there is the more computational, the more material. And this is what material computation as practiced by people as different as Akim Mengus in Stuttgart or Jenny Sabin in Cornell is about. So, brave new world, but it doesn't mean that this is a world without contradiction. And let me pinpoint, let me point a few contradictions in this conception of materiality. The first is that we dream of collaborating with matter, of a soft kind of relation. And at the same time, we've never designed matter as much in a top-down matter, in a top-down way. And we're creating, by the way, monsters that blur the distinction between material and structure. And that may be very often non-sustainable. Take, sorry, that was material company. Take composite. Composite are very often very hard to recycle. And they're cutting edge material science, just like smart materials. We want to collaborate with matter. And at the same time, we've never been as violent. For example, we dream of no longer separating matter and information pertaining to it. If you read Ingold, for example, Ingold will critique traditional design as trying to impose information and order pre-ordained pre, uh, information to matter. But actually take digital fabrication. Digital fabrication is about a radical split between the file on the one hand and the weight injected almost literally in matter through a 3D printer. So contradiction also affect or take, it's not only about matter, about or take about what it means to be human. So on the one hand, you have all these discourses in which we shouldn't be as proud as we are very, we used to be about, uh, as humans, we shouldn't be as uh, conceive ourselves as so dramatically different, etc. We should blur the distinction between the human and the non-human. But simultaneously, there is a tendency today to look for augmentation 
for the advent of a kind of superhuman. And the apostles of the singularity are typical of this ambiguity, you know, all these disciples of, you know, Kurzweil or equivalent who try to dream of a kind of superhuman. Among the contradiction also, we tend to dissolve ourselves into a digital world and a world that is a total environment in some ways you know, uh, on a social network, I'm no longer only traditionally myself, I'm a point of view on the network, uh, like a Leibniz and Monad. But at the same time, this is the age in which we're also trying desperately of making sense of ourselves as these subjective individuals uh, confer, you know, the fashion that Tattoo used to have uh, still a few years ago. To finish this long, I could go for a longer and longer. This resonates with the ambiguity around the notion of nature. If you read thinkers like Latour, if you read also uh, people like Philippe Descola in France, or you know, a philosopher like Tim, Timothy Morton, they all tell you that actually nature is actually a fake thing. There is no such thing as nature. We should rather imagine humans and non-humans, but you know there is not an outside the human realm nature. But actually, we've never spoken as much about nature as today. It always strikes me as you know there are a lot of today environmental people who quote La Latour while actually pretending to speak in the name of nature. So I could go on and on. So what I'd like to convey I had a, uh, is that we should not worry that much about these contradictions. They are actually there. I had something on artificial intelligence, but I'll pass on that because I want to not be too long. And I've been actually much shorter than what I imagined, but I'll hope you'll have questions. A re, what I, when I said at the beginning that materiality is not an idea, it's a conflicted field. So these contradictions are part of the rising form of materiality today. They're just, and actually just like, you know, probably to be human is to be, to be profoundly not sure of what it means. Very often I believe that artificial intelligence, the main interest of artificial intelligence is not the artificiality of the intelligence, is that it forces us to reconsider again, are we sure of what it means to be human? So to conclude that thing, just to say that, you know, there are um, medieval philosopher, Maimonides, uh, you know, uh, explained once that sometimes the best way to understand something is through its contradiction. And he took the example of fire. Fire blackens certain substance, it whitens others. Doesn't mean that fire is contradictory in itself. It means that simply we cannot characterize it in, with, in simple terms. Perhaps the same is true of this rising regime of materiality. Okay, you're still alive. Okay, now comes the end and the easiest part. So. And it's true, I've been, sorry, Beatrice, I've been very fast, but probably because this is the first time I'm giving this lecture. So, so now I'm going to try to be a bit provocative and I hope you profoundly dislike it. Uh, but let me first state that one of the reason, and you know, I remember to be honest, Beatrice Mariol a few years ago when I published my book on ornament telling me that he was not sure that it was actually a decent subject. That really struck me because Beatrice was very much in his moral mo mood. Uh, so she was thinking that ornament was clearly not ethical. And now she's organizing a seminar in which there is the word ornament in the title. So something has happened. I think what has happened is that we're realizing more and more that ornament as manipulated by the digital, but not only, is expressing a number of key contradiction and tension linked to this rise of a new form of materiality. It is, for example, linked to the idea of a subject that is distributed, that no longer inhabits only its body, that is actually dispersed or distributed like a field. And, you know, in some ways, 
part of what ornament does today is to blur the distinction to try to abolish the distance between the observer and the architectural object. As if the traditional modernist stance of the observer uh, at a distance was no longer possible. So which explains also why ornament is so often blurring codes pertaining respectively to vision and touch, as if to see was to touch, as if there was no empty space anymore that could enable an observer to be outside and observe with detachment a scene. But let's at the same time not forget, I mentioned earlier that sometimes we tend to regroup to reaffirm our identity as isolated individual. That ornament is also linked to the idea of pleasure. And because of pleasure, it is linked to a sensation that we own. You know, this is Evan Douglas. I really like probably this, the only ornament, architectural ornament really evocative of Italian ice cream. Uh, so blurring vision and licking, but uh, of course, having to do with pleasure. So on the one hand, ornament tend to dissolve, to erode the contour of the self. On the other hand, it reinstates the self uh, through the pleasure that, um, that uh, it, the self experiences. So where do I want to go? that probably we need to expand the field of ornament beyond what the digital has done. Uh, and it may be necessary for the architecture of the environmental transition to be raising this issue. Why? Because ornament may be, because we, we, in a way, we are in a paradoxical moment in which we know so many things about materials. But at the same time, there is a kind of crisis of meaning. And so uh, in some ways, one of the question is how to make sense, and I'll come back to this notion of making sense of the world, how to make sense of material from you know, biosourced to composite, et cetera. And because actually when I say make sense, it's also about making, self, making sense of ourselves in, this world. So which means that actually, who are we? It pro is probably the ultimate question today and the question that we raised through materials. So what I'd like to propose at this stage are a couple of considerations. The first is that this should be avoided, in, in, to be clear, in my opinion, but I'll pass on that clearly. If you have questions, we can talk about that later. I think one of the interesting things for me about ornament is that it's actually com completely contradictory to the kind of Laturian doxa that we hear so often, we've never been modern, or we're really postmodern, or blah, blah, blah. I think actually the truth is that we're both modern and postmodern. We're postmodern definitely because we tend to dissolve the contour of the traditional modernist subject, but we're still modernist at certain other moments. And ornament enables in some ways to blur or to challenge the fact that we should be either modern or postmodern. I think actually what we're living today, which is, I'm not the only one to think that actually, uh, the a late French uh, urban theorist, Francois Acher, was suggesting that actually, instead of postmodernism, one should speak about hypermodernism. So the modernism has not been abandoned, contrary to what we think, and the old world still very much there. So we have actually, if we want to inv invent a new world, we have to, to create a space for what is still the very present old world. And ornament, because it enables actually both to challenge modernist individuality and actually to recreate it at times is something interesting. Now, leaving aside these philosophical consideration, I think one of the problems today is also to provide luxury and pleasure. Ornament was very much about pleasure. 
to make the world more ac acceptable, the new, the new world acceptable and even enthrally. So this entails dealing with biosource materials in innovative ways. And frankly, virtue is not enough. Virtue cannot stay forever, except in Sparta, but which was mostly a fiction, if there is not some pleasure somewhere. And once again, this is not necessarily the solution. So this is actually where I like, I mentioned Akim Megas, I like some of his work. This is actually a work in which, you know, the openings and the closing are determined by the, humi the surrounding humidity of the air, but it's at the same time, quite a beautiful ornament. I think there is something about uh, design and the link between aesthetics and pleasure. So where I want to go, and I hope you'll disagree with me, is that as designers, your task is not to save the world. Honestly, if you wanted to save the world, you should have studied engineering. You know, the, the engineers, they are relatively poor designers, but they're the one usually who tell, who tell you, uh, who find solution. So let's be clear. It's not to advocate that designers should be completely ignorant of what's going on, should be designing absurd thing, et cetera. But I think designers, the most fundamental task is to suggest that human action have a meaning. This is what I call to make sense of the world. I think the challenge of the Anthropocene is actually for design to, to use design to suggest that the world can still be inhabited, that it's still a world in which humans have a place. If you look very often at the discourse on climate change, what it tends to convey is that there will be no place for humans. So I think, so of course, you've got to use uh, all kinds of technology to mitigate climate change, and we all know that, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the main challenge for architecture is to make sense of it, instead of remaining in a state of stupefaction. Another way to put that would be to say that we have to transform the Anthropocene, not it's right now, it's our fate. It's something we haven't, we unfortunately, uh, you know, we're, were unable so far to consider it as uh, different than a destiny. We should transform it into a theater, a theater in which we have a part to play. And I think this is where for me, ornament plays a role. Think of the role very often of the ornamental in traditional theater to set a stage in which human action have a sense. And with that, I'm going to stop and we, if, so let me stop sharing my screen. And for those who survived, uh, probably in, once I will have given this lecture another time, it may be simpler. Uh, did, sorry, stop sharing. There we go. Hello. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have uh, many people, I don't know how many, uh, outside of Venice. I don't know if uh, anyone has uh, questions here or on the web. They were all frozen like. Absolutely. No, my discourse, let's be clear, it's not an anti-technological discourse. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it's just that the, this knowledge is like the white page. 
on which then you can begin to write. It's just to say that it's not because you've used biosource materials that you've solved in easy, in significantly the design issue of the Anthropocene. What you've done is actually good engineering homework. You have begun to propose a solution, but actually architecture is not about solution. Architecture, it's actually the reverse. When I say it's a theater scene, architecture suggests that now you have to be an actor and to play a part. You know, a theater does not, prov a theater is not a theater play. A theater is a place that suggests that the theater, a theater play can take place. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. And what do you think? Uh, what are the, the the relationship between the different materials? Because you showed many uh, many pictures with uh, metal, concrete, uh, even straw. Uh, what do you think uh, the, the relationship between uh, this, between materials and ornaments? Well, what I said at a certain point is that we have to accept, because I'm getting a bit fed up with the new, the world of tomorrow, the new world, etc. because guess what? We're still going to live very much in the old world. So we have actually to try to blend the new and the old. Take concrete. Concrete is not going to disappear. We have to limit its use. We have also to improve, to decarbonate it as much as we can. And there is series of technologies, uh, you know, there are, I won't enter into all the details of that, but there are actually an array of technology now, et cetera. But we should definitely limit its use. Take wood. Very often what is called wood is are actually products in which there are a lot of glue, which is not very good. So it's not virtuous wood as opposed to uh, criminal concrete. It's a bit more complex. So I think what we have to accept, we have also to accept some form of impurity. I think uh, this is also a di difference between engineer, et cetera. Uh, you have to accept that there is not a black and white solution to things. And you have to accept also that by the end design, you know, the quotation by Oleg Grabar say basically architecture does not tell people exactly what they should do. Architecture is trying to suggest that what they do matters. I think one of the big question of the of, of the trans, the uh, environmental transition is to gently nudge people so that what they first they believe that what they do matters and I think one of the difficulty today a lot of people think that it's you know whatever they do nothing is going to change so this is one of the tasks of design and and I think that uh, something perhaps more fundamental than trying to uh, really channel them completely, et cetera. So what you do has a sense, has a meaning. I think ornament is back because in some ways we have a nostalgia of pleasure, you know, the, the traditional pleasure, but also of meaning. And, you know, traditional ornament was actually associated these categories, which usually <clears throat> don't go together Yes, really, which is pleasure and meaning. Which is why, by the way, I use also so much the theater thing. Uh, in some ways, a good play is something that associate the pleasure to listen to the play, to watch the play. And the idea, and you don't know by the end when I say meaning, it's not classic symbolism or whatever, but you have the impression that life has gained in depth. And I think architecture is something that is about this gain in depth.
Um, I, I would like to know a bit um, what you think about uh, or, uh, ornamental and modularity, for example. How you how we can because in my like when I think of an ornament, um, I immediately think of how it has evolved from structures. Um, in the way that we build structures. For example, um, in Venice, we see a lot that earlier, when you had beams go out of the building on the roof, you have these small boxes, and now, uh, well, that gets translated into being an ornament for the building itself. Um, so you start making it in plaster instead of, uh, so it's a symbolic expression of the structure that becomes an ornament into a building later on. Um, uh, and then I also feel that um, ornament has a bit to do with modularity, um, repetition, for example. Um, yeah, I, yeah, it would be nice to know. If, if, if you... Well, there's another class on ornament that could last for one year, so I'm going to try to simplify. I think ornament is always linked at a certain moment to a kind of dissociation between the essential and something that appears as less essential and a kind of subversion of this distinction. So you took the example, for example, the well-known example of the triglyph as you know, the extremity of the beam, uh, et cetera, in the Doric order, but actually ornament begins when you transpose into something that has no clear utility beginning with structural utility, something of a different order. So I think you're completely right on the link with modularity or more generally rhythm. I would say ornament is something that, and this is how ornament could be so important and at the same time added because ornament is something that outline rhythm. You know, very often you hear sometimes that architecture is frozen music. Uh, it may be true or not true, but there is something about architecture that has to do with rhythm. And ornament is a way to approach that. Just like today, ornament has to do with patterning, with textures, etc., which are a fundamental aspect of what the digital enables to do with buildings. So we have, of course, to find other ways to understand rhythm than at the time of the Vitruvian tradition or, or Islamic architecture, etc. Uh, but, but nevertheless, there is still this idea of something that gives rhythm. And like, do you uh, today like to design, like, if you want to design an ornament, do you think it would be more uh, relevant to uh, to draw it like uh, in a very traditional way, uh, or to I don't know to experiment directly with materials, or to design it on a computer, or uh, like? I, I think okay. I'm not going to simplify because guess what? I'm not. I don't want too much to tell you what you should design as ornament, but what I want to suggest that ornament is rooted in an attitude. In an attitude in which you begin to question, is there a difference between the essential and, the, and what I believe is more superficial or futile, etc. You know, which uh, you begin to question whether, you know, problem solving is more important than providing meaning to things. You begin, and then what are the operation you're going to use? I think they're still a little bit undecided. They have definitely to do more than in previous period with, for example, texturing. Clearly, this is one of the things that we've seen emerging at the intersection of the digital and the new interest for materials, which is a kind of interest into texturing uh, a kind of tactile dimension of, um, of architecture, etc. But uh, I, I would say, you know, in some ways, you know, ornament begins with light. You know, after all, you know, architecture complicates, you know, an engineer will just put windows so that, for example, you can work or etc. Architect complicate light. Take Le Corbusier. You know, La Tourette is an endless complication in light. 
sometimes you don't see where it comes from. Sometimes it's direct, sometimes it's etc. So architecture complicates. And by complicating, suggest that actually things have are meaningful you know just like architecture for example complicate thresholds you know think of the number of buildings which are interesting because actually between outside and inside they create ambiguities they create sequences that were are not just a door or just a passage from inside to outside I have another question. Yes. Uh, you talked about um, ornament as, as pleasure. And I was, um, I was thinking about the, um, the maybe also political and social meaning of ornaments, and maybe as something that, um, that the world, which is um, facing climate change and other problems, um, maybe needs. But, um, yeah, in this way, as um, another abstract um, sim symbolism, could it maybe also um, not be seen as a classical or traditional ornament you see in Venice, for example, but something that maybe um, yeah, isn't seen directly? Maybe it's something that is yeah, acting like maybe a turn between the human and the non human things, maybe. Um, yeah, that's a little bit what I wanted to suggest. I think you've said it very nicely. I, I believe that ornament is always political because ornaments say something about who we are. It says something also about who can inhabit and who is not invited. Which, and you know, there have been unpleasant ornament, which signified that some people were not invited. You know, Nazi, the Nazi regime used ornament in a very cunning way and um, not necessarily very pleasant uh, to say the least and so there are politics of ornament that may be good or bad I think today seems to me we we need a few things that we tend you know we have so much this kind of we're petrified by the fear of the catastrophe because it's petrifying and, you know, there is not a single day in which, you know, we hear something new about the Gulf Stream going to stop, the ice cap going to melt, all kinds of horrible things, etc. We're petrified. We need, and the, 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 this kind of attitude shrinks us and the space around us. So we need to re-expand that space. In other words, we need hope. And we need also a future in which there will be pleasure. It will not be only a punishment. We're going to be punished because our predecessor acted badly. And that ultimately, it's also a world in which what we do, again, has a relevance. So we need all that. So um, uh, you take Venice. Venice is a fantastic. What I uh, I have also, um, you know, among the theoretical notion I use, I use the notion of decor. You know, as what ornament produce, which is a kind of immersive environment. Venice is a decor, and it was a decor for re republic for centuries. Uh, so, so we we need in some ways. When I say the Anthropocene should be a theater, so that actually we're convoked to act on this stage and not looking right now, there is no stage. We're looking at a catastrophe. We're completely petrified, frozen. There is no real space. It, and we're going all to be punished. The major, the discourse is, you know, in your duration from now, smartphone is going to be confiscated, a little bit like, you know, the Chinese president now wants to deprive children of video games. Uh, so we're, you're all going to be punished. For, fortunately for me, I'm old enough, I will escape part of the punishment. But uh, for you guys, you know, 20 years from now, it's going to be punished 
uh, to have a, a personal smartphone, it's going to be punished. You know, it's not fun. So, so one of the tasks of design is actually, is very seriously, it's about trying to, uh, without falling into some rosy ideology, but tell us why is this new world with its constraints going to be also pleasurable? Meaningful and pleasurable. Um, is there any question from, uh, from the web? From the world? Yes, Kelly? Anton, thanks uh, a lot. I thought the, the lecture was really fantastic. Um, I was really puzzled by your title of, of juxtaposing Anthropocene and ornament. And um, you convinced me that they can be put together in a, in a brief but powerful, powerful lecture. I, I wonder if um, I've personally been, been very, I, I'm not as intrigued as I, as I think, at least through your readings, I understand maybe you are with some of the digital um, in the sense that it is a celebration of engineering of problem solving and I and to me becoming a bit uh, generic. I think what was interesting in past histories of ornament and of architecture is that it was very, it told cultural, it told stories of not a generic man, human um, and where we are and where we're going but, but very nuanced cultural myths and stories. And I wonder if you, if you think future ornament can begin to do that or if we're too much if we're too far say beyond that in terms of our interconnected politics economics and technology thank you it's a complex question i have probably more sympathy than you do for the digital but let me be clear, for me, the digital is one of the symptoms of a massive cultural change. And that's what I try to convey, that actually we've got to think of the environmental crisis at the same time we think of the digital. Let's not forget that after all, computer simulation are completely fundamental in a climate change scenario that actually the, the world in which we live and breathe is completely permeated by digital technologies. So we've got actually to civilize the digital, which is far from dawn, and probably also uh, to borrow from it. I think the digital has been instrumental in you know, raising again the question of the ornament. I think the digital has been unable so far to give ornament a completely convincing uh, turn. So I, I do think that actually we need, a, I've been thinking that for a while, that actually if we don't connect more urgently, this is where I'm probably very different from Mario, for example, Mario Carpo, et cetera, is that I do believe that if we are not able to connect more than what we've done so far, the digital and the environmental, this is going to be a serious problem. I'm struck in School of Architecture, in a corner you have kids doing algorithm, et cetera. In another corner, uh, kids doing biosource materials and they don't talk much to each other. Uh, and actually this is the conversation we need to have. An ornament maybe actually, what it, not ornament only, but we should actually reinterpret also what is tectonics today? what is ornament, etc. I don't think we have yet the answer, but they're a relatively important question for me. But I agree, the, the digital in itself has only broke part of the answer. I think there is, for example, a dramatic lack of political relevance very often in the digital. And the social dimension, dimension. What about the social dimension? Because I quite, I quite agree with uh, what you, uh, when you say that designer 
had to give sense or set a stage for, uh, for the future. And uh, I really appreciated the, the, the notion of complex, complicity with matter and the relationship between matter and humanity. But uh, um, if we consider that uh, nowadays, at least in, in Europe, but the, the question is more uh, to transform the existing territories, the existing buildings, than to build the new wonderful ones. Uh, how the, 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 the social uh, dimension interfere with, with that? Well, in a lot of ways. Well, for me, political and social, I don't separate the two. So when I say political, I tend to mean political and social. Let me take a very simple example, which is, you know, one of the questions of our societies. There again, architecture does not necessarily fight inequality, but architecture makes it sometimes visible. And architecture may trigger reflection on it and architecture also may foster common understanding you know a monument used to be something that made sense to a large array of people and i think the crisis of monumentality at the end of modernism is actually a was actually a much more serious question than what we uh, we tend to retain very often because it went with the end of a certain kind of social understanding so and one of the function of ornament, by the way, was also to create a common understanding, a common world. So uh, where I'm probably different from you, Beatrice, is that you're more saving the world type than I am. Uh, but, um, uh, but I do believe that if you truly want to save the world, and you know, I could critique actually your whole seminar in Venice is an ornament. You know, why Venice and not Lille or, uh, uh, or et cetera? Why on earth are you in this pleasurable place to talk about the drama of our world? Uh, truth is you need pleasure and you need et cetera. And you need, and this is a way also to reach a common understanding. And then you realize that actually the futile is extremely important in society. Yeah. You talk about the social class, etc. Take the importance of having the right kind of Nike or Reebok in the suburbs, uh, and then you realize that actually, uh, you know, uh, less aesthetics, more ethics. What if actually ethics and aesthetics were not separable? Mm -hmm. Next question: Workshop would be in Lens. <laughs> in where? Where? Lens. 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 Yeah. Good. No, no, but you know, it's not. It's not a critique. It's just an observation. Yeah. It's just that actually, you you cannot live without ornaments, and don't forget that ornament is a way to stabilize society, which is why we have, for example, decorations. Oh which uh, and actually as you know social order and ornament have links and the crisis of ornament has been also a crisis of the social order mm -hmm. but, you know maybe really the difference between a, a concrete and mud for example is that is that uh, uh, mud can be more uh, collaborative and more uh, uh, self construction or self decoration, self ornament? Is Europe and concrete, for example? I don't know because you can imagine, you know, I don't know because you have concrete, you know, concrete in India, you know, at a certain point was a completely different. I, I think let's not impart materials necessarily with properties that are actually uh, things that human bring to them, you know, the, the material determinism is not that strong, always. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. More questions? 
Is the difference between ornament and art for you? Or is this the same thing? So there is a strong difference. You may remember the quotation by Grabar ends by saying architecture is not art. I would say architecture frames art. Not architecture, ornament, ornament, only ornament. No, well, ornament can be sometimes embedded with a high artistic value, but then it becomes sometimes problematic as ornament. Uh, you know, when, for example, Carpeau does the group of a dance on the facade of the Opera of Paris, Garnier is furious because Carpeau has hijacked part of the facade mm -hmm. to transform it into something. Ornament is expressive up to a certain point. If it becomes too expressive, it may become art, but then it's a problem. For <laughs> It's a problem. Well, it's because part of architecture is all the more powerful when it's it remains somewhat discreet. Mm -hmm. The problem with architecture is that, again, it has to allow you to inhabit. Can you inhabit a work of art? Mm -hmm. Or it may be that I'm ignorant about art, but but it's and you know that's a little bit the limit of Le Corbusier. Sometimes, can you can you inhabit something that is so amazingly a master, so amazing a masterpiece? Because inhabiting must whisper to you that you have a place in the world. It shouldn't shout at you, hey. I'm what I am, and I'm going to to make you experience powerful things. It's a bit more. Now, I, I thought about it because there was a very important exhibition in '68 in Bern when attitude became form. You know, you know it perhaps. And and you say uh, ornament uh, is roots in a in an attitude. So this. This kind of um, orientation. Well, that, I, that, that I believe to be even, I believe in addition to complicate even further, if, uh, students just shut your ears because it's going to be boring. Uh, I believe that ornament is also more something like an, opera an operation. Mm. That, for example, ornament begins when you begin to subvert the distinction between the fabric and the skin or between the essential and the superficial, et cetera, which explains why there is ornament is not a fixed category of objects. And you know, the big problem ever in architectural history and theory is the column, because the column sometimes is an ornament and sometimes is not an ornament. And Alberti has very conflicted views about that and he's not the only one. It's because actually it depends what you do with a column. And something can be at a certain scale, envisage at a certain scale, not an ornament, at another scale, uh, seen as an ornament. So yeah. that could fit with a certain definition of art, yeah. which would be more performative than centered on the piece. You see what I mean? So if we take that definition of art as something that is performative, Perhaps. Yes, all this performative since a few years now. Yeah, per perhaps today, yes. But, mm -hmm. uh, but, but, you know, I'm by the end a very classic uh, uh, aging European male. So, you know, my notion of art is, uh, you know, old fashioned. <laughs> Um, can, I, can I ask one more thing? Um, sure. Anton, I, I know you, you were hesitant and you, you, you gave them, of course, provocative uh, image of um, Boeri's um, Milan trees, 
which I, I think for, for many, um, or I, I think for many students of architecture around the world, this remains, mm -hmm. I agree with your, your, your short, um, this is what should absolutely be avoided. But I wonder if, if you can elaborate particularly in, in relation in this lecture, in putting together ornament and Anthropocene, if you can, if you can elaborate on that a little bit, because I, I think it remains an image um, and a kind of, I would almost say cheap trick for, for many students of architecture to try to, to take on. But I, I wonder if you, could, if you could be very explicit on your views on why that should absolutely be avoided. Well, I was perhaps too radical. I would say what should absolutely be avoided is, tr is transforming a serious issue into a superficial image. I think finding ways to associate living beings with the metabolism of a building is a serious question today. So I'm not against plantation, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I think more generally, you know, if we take this idea of, you know, uh, mobilizing life, et cetera, uh, um, life with and blurring the distinction between organic life and artificial, that's a very serious question. Uh, but as soon as you transform it into a kind of Babylon suspended garden thing, uh, I think you lose completely. Uh, side of what should be at stake. This So rather than not do, I think it's a dangerously seductive image because it is linked to a real problem, but it's certainly not done. It's a little bit like Calbo, also, you know, uh, this uh, guy who does also all these green tower thing. And there is one in Taipei currently being completed, etc. I think it's a real question, uh, but I think it's a false answer. And that's actually design at its worst. So not being engineering, but, uh, uh, but proposing, you know, superficial answers to, uh, to real questions. And in some ways, I think we should know more about the engineering in some ways, I, I think, because there are probably ways to make these function but it, it raises all kinds. So I was perhaps a bit brutal, but also because I'm a bit tired, to be honest also, I'm a bit tired of the people who say, I don't use ornament, but, and then the trees are just ornament in its worst thing. As I say, not very thought of. You know, for example, what matters is just that there is this impression of lush vegetation, but not much thinking about what to plant, you know, how do these plants create an ecology of their own and all those questions. I envy the Venice group because you're going to have now a meal uh, in one of the little restaurants, I suppose. That's great. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Uh. Uh, I'm sure that Lens will be as delightful next year. Yeah, but uh, tonight seems that it's uh, raining a lot, but uh, that's okay. It's raining? It's raining? Yeah. And during the conference, there was a, where is it? Hailstorm. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. Well, Paris is okay. I have one last question. Yes. Uh, because it seems that you, you went one step uh, one step further than the, your last book, The Med Materiality, talking about Anthropocene. Will your next book be on, about Anthropocene? My next book, well, if I live long enough to see it, be, um, will should be about nature and cities. That's, okay. uh, but actually the English version of the book on materiality, which is a third longer than the French one, has wow. already a number of passages on the Anthropocene because actually the English version is a considerable rewriting compared to the French version. It's not on, it's not a mere translation. It's actually different in a number of, of aspect. And there is an additional chapter at the end, etc. 
So, so yes, it's a direction I've taken, you know, I, I was asked a year ago to write uh, an article for AD by Ali Rahim, but he was very surprised because he wanted, he expected something on the digital digital. And I wrote a piece on the necessity to uh, precisely to have the digital and the environmental converge. For me, it's probably linked to strangely the work I did on smart cities. I have very often the impression the next for urban frontier, because in some ways, smart cities, they're with us. So the fuss is over. Uh, you know, they're with us, with the pro and con, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the next real question, which is why I'm so interested still in buildings with trees, is how do we rethink the relation between nature and the city? So that's probably going to be one of my projects. Okay, great. So I just read the, the French, the French version of Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I do that sometimes. You know, the English version of Smart Cities is also a relatively different book. So uh, the book on ornament is very much a translation, but very often when I write, when I, uh, the English version tend to be a bit longer. Okay. Whichever reason. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me, even in a virtual right. format. Of course, I would have loved rather to have a to, to have pasta along a canal, but uh, another <laughs> time. <laughs> another time, perhaps. Take care, every one of you, and okay. have a great have a great uh, seminar. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye everyone.